I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. Changes to Policy 713 in New Brunswick schools have sparked worldwide conversation about gender affirming care, despite most of us not knowing much about it, including policymakers. Here to shed light on gender affirming care and to take our questions about it is renowned endocrinologist, Dr. John Dornan. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Dornan. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can we start off by talking about what is an endocrinologist, just to start? Well, I've uh, practiced uh, endocrinology in, in New Brunswick for almost 37 years now. And uh, what it is is the study and treatment of hormonal problems. So endocrinology refers to a hormone. And the biggest areas that I would work with are um, diabetes and thyroid, for example. Uh, the thyroid gland makes hormones and you either make too much of it or not enough of it. Uh, so that is in my field. Uh, diabetes is a, a problem with the hormone insulin. Uh, people with type 1 diabetes don't make enough of the hormone, so we give people insulin. People with type 2 diabetes often have a resistance to the hormone, so we develop ways to help their insulin work better to improve glucose control. Pituitary gland is another hormonal entity. And where um, gender dysphoria or transgenderism comes into play is that very often the hormones that a person has uh, support their biologic uh, gender. And as they go through transitions, it's often necessary or preferred to help uh, provide gender um, reaffirming uh, therapy in the form of hormones. So that's why it's a field that um, that I have become involved in for, for a long time and uh, have you know uh, experience as it's um, as I have practiced and I, as I have seen other people practice and as the literature has grown on um, gender confirming care. How early can gender dysphoria start? When is it first recognized? Well there's no absolute minimum. Uh, you know we used to think that this was a, a phenomena that we would see only in adults. In fact, when I started um, helping people with uh, gender dysphoria around 1990, I, I hadn't contemplated that it would be an issue for younger people. So that was a population that we, we helped with. But when you would talk with people and ask, when did this first, when did the idea that maybe you're in the wrong uh, gender come to play? And they would often say, well, when I was 14 or when I was 17 or when I was there was a hint that there was a problem with the, their assigned gender. So it's not surprising that um, as time has evolved, uh, we become more familiar with gender dysphoria in young people. Now, uh, you have to be um, communicating with other people. You have to have acknowledged or known a difference between the way genders behave to realize this is not me. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, um, behavior can be misconstrued, i.e. somebody, uh, a younger person might prefer, uh, a male might prefer feminine clothes. It doesn't mean they're necessarily transgender. But from a very early on, we have to be aware that um, gender or sexuality occurs at many different levels. And some people will express that in different ways. When we think of gender dysphoria, it's often somebody that really wishes they were the alternate gender or in some instances somewhere between. Mm -hmm. uh, we have folks that are um, non-binary that aren't really comfortable completely as women or not completely comfortable as, as men. So I'm kind of avoiding your question. It's very individual. Uh, I would say in the uh, early, early adolescence, mm -hmm. uh, childhood is when the thought starts to germinate and then depending on how, uh, how disruptive it is to that person in their day-to-day -day life, uh, they'll express that more and then ev eventually may, may seek help. Uh, when would something like puberty blockers be used and at, at what point in a journey with a patient would you prescribe something like that? Sure. Um, early in one's life uh, you have difference in genitalia but not otherwise. Uh, our bodies are very similar and it's through puberty that you start to develop secondary sexual changes. Uh, breast growth, um, uh, hair growth, uh, sexually dependent hair growth, um, and uh, other phenomena that are characteristic of the stereotypic male or female. And that starts to um, have an impact on how we grow, how we look. 
in puberty. And so if someone is uh, confirmed uh, to, be, uh, to have gender dysphoria, transgender, uh, they often abhor the changes that puberty brings because it brings them more to looking like uh, their biologic sex. Mm -hmm. So while often, and in, in I treat mostly, well exclusively adults, you are trying to undo some of the changes that puberty has brought into adult years and the earlier folks undergo therapy, the more likely they are to um, look like, become uh, the target gender. So if children identify as transgender and, and they have the support of parents, teachers, psychologists, and it looks like they are truly transgender, the earlier you intervene, the more likely they do not develop into the gender that they don't want. And so, so gender blockers are often used at what we call Tanner stage two mm. of sexual development. So you are starting to develop uh, some degree of uh, body hair, some early breast development, some changes in uh, genitalia. And so those are the times that one considers um, hormone blocking therapies. And um, you know, what, what it does do is it delays uh, puberty so that as you age a bit more, you can look at not just blocking, but supporting the hormones of mm -hmm. the target sex. It's never done easily. Um, you have to have a lot of support by a whole team of people uh, that I've mentioned. Parents, psychologists, teachers, friends, um, schoolmates. Mm -hmm. And um, so you had to have all those at play, and sometimes we don't have all those at play. It becomes difficult. For example, uh, we might have difficulty getting psychologists involved. Mm -hmm. It's great that uh, we're looking at more psychologists in our school system. Uh, it's critical that um, the parents play a role. The downside is that kids that are having uh, gender dysphoric thoughts rarely talk to their parents first. Mm -hmm. When I talk to pediatric endocrinologists, they know. Uh, they talk to their friends, they'll talk to their teachers. And then those groups of people often help them transition to uh, talking to parents. Mm -hmm. So parents are rarely the first to know, they shouldn't be the last to know. Mm -hmm. And so we work with, um, with children to help, help them. You know, the, the first thing is do no harm. And so if we can help a child uh, be at their full potential, uh, support them to different transitions, whether it's transgender or some other uh, medical issues, um, we realize it requires, should have a team. Mm -hmm. Something like puberty blockers, um, would that have side effects? Are there, are there concerns when, when those, those are prescribed? Yes, there's no drug in this world that doesn't have a side effect. And sometimes the side effects are what you want. For example, um, if, you, if you're a biologic female and you give a person testosterone, well, one of the side effects of testosterone is hair growth, mm -hmm. is uh, masculinization of, of musculature. Uh, decrease in periods, for example. So they all have some side effects, and not all of them are desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, when you put uh, a biologic female on testosterone because they're trans male, uh, it can cause hair growth, but it can also cause acne. It can cause a change in behavior. You may become more aggressive. So knowing that, uh, if caregivers know that, psychologists know that, you can balance the treatment against those possible side mm -hmm. effects. And if you are taking puberty blockers, what would happen if you just stopped? Would that just, puberty would start instantly? Uh, it wouldn't start instantly, but it would start. Uh, without drugs you suppress hormones, uh, then your body goes back to its uh, natural, uh, biologic born state, and it would start to secrete hormones that would push you along the biologic pathway. And how long could you take them for? Could you take them till you're, let's say, 18 and an adult and can make decisions on your own, or, or does it have a, t a length of time that it's appropriate? Well, that's a good question, Vicki. Um, making decisions on your own. Well, kids make decisions on their own all the time, some of them riskier than others. And we talk about the notion of a uh, mature uh, minor, where they are able to understand the consequences or not. And that's what we worry about. Do, do children understand uh, what they're doing when they take hormonal therapy? Uh, by the time they get to their late teens, 20s, 
they continue on that same path. Mm -hmm. It's not that the hormonal therapy uh, stops them in their tracks from progressing further. It delays it, and if you stop it then, then they usually revert back to uh, their natural trajectory. So what, what happens is if we, um, in some instances, don't allow some gender-confirming hormonal therapy when it's appropriate, in discussion with all those folks, uh, then they start to develop uh, secondary sexual characteristics that are harder to get used to. Mm. Um, for example, deepening of the voice. Mm. It's harder to undo that. Uh, hair growth, it's harder to undo that. So, so I wouldn't necessarily promote hormonal blockers uh, mm -hmm. in everybody, but sometimes when it's cleared, you've got a team involved, it, it is very helpful. It helps them grow up looking more like the target gender that they've wanted. What would be the next phase after that, after puberty blockers, um, if you are on the path to transition? Well, that's a good question. It's the area that I deal with mostly. I, I don't deal with children at all. So I would see people in their adult years that either started the transition when they were children or uh, became aware that there's um, help for transgender people in their adult years. So oftentimes uh, if they'll report to a family doctor and frankly family doctors are more familiar now with the whole concept of gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. So some of them actually start uh, evaluating, referring to a psychologist, considering therapy, and some are sent to me because I've done it for, for such a long time. So what would happen is I would see a, um, uh, an individual that feels that they are transgender. I would take a history about when these thoughts started, what they're doing about it. Um, have they spoken to family members, parents, um, friends, teachers, students, uh, and see where they are in my own mind. Uh, you know, I apply the um, guidelines of what's called WPATH, the World uh, Professional Association for Transgender Health. And this is a group of international experts who publishes and gives us recommendations what to do. So I would evaluate a patient, uh, a person, um, and I, I, I use that word because they're not really patients, they're not sick people, they're people that just are in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. And so I would evaluate folks, get a history, find out what their goals are. Everybody has different goals. Mm -hmm. And determine how I might be best be able to help. So what I often do is a baseline set of uh, blood tests to look at their hormonal pro profile as well, as well as other tests. And um, I ask them if they've had support or assessment uh, by uh, psychologists or psychiatrists and help them get that. That's been a difficulty in our community is psychiatric psychological assessment. Mm. We haven't had people experienced or trained in that uh, up until recently. And uh, for people, where that assessment has been new, they've been reluctant to do it. Mm. And so when I first started helping transgender people, I would say, well, it makes sense, it se you seem to be transgender, uh, let's wait until we get a psychi psychiatric evaluation here. Mm. And that would take a year or more. Mm. So all I did was prolong what was almost an inevitable. And so then more people started to be trained and able to help. We've had uh, a few psychologists in the community that are accessible, willing to do it. Uh, same thing with respect to psychiatrists. And so that's been a, an advancement, but we still don't have enough. Um, psychology assessment for uh, transgenderism, gender dysphoria, uh, is not covered by uh, our health plan. So if you have insurance, fine. If you don't have insurance, then you have to wait for something that is covered within the uh, healthcare plan. And that means going exclusively to a psychiatrist. Mm. And, uh, and that could take a long time, whereas if there was some level of coverage, and we're working in Horizon and other areas to look at providing that level of uh, assessment that will be covered uh, within the Medicare program. What can that do, just aside from just your body having to wait? Um, but mentally that must uh, play a factor if, if someone is at home experiencing uh, the, this desire and feeling stuck, waiting for all levels of, of help. Well, uh, I'll share with you an alarming statistic. Um, many transgender people have depression and it largely stems from their gender dysphoria. They're not comfortable in their bodies and they're often on um, psychotropic or antidepressive therapies. 
40% of all transgender people will attempt suicide at some point in their life. So when I see someone that has uh, gender dysphoria, that stat sits in my mind. And while I say, well, I'm not, a, uh, you know, I need to have them assessed. They seem to be uh, suffering from gender dysphoria. I need to have them assessed, but, you know, and we'll get the other parts of the assessment done, um, the exam, the blood work, but I'm more inclined to treat earlier than later mm -hmm. in the adult world um, because the treatment is so much less risky than not treating. Mm -hmm. First, do no harm. And uh, if you can put people on uh, gender-confirming hormonal therapy, you know, they tend to feel better fairly quickly. They can see, they can feel that transition. Mm -hmm. And you may not have changed the actual hormone levels uh, tremendously, but even small changes can go a long way in terms of a person's sense of well-being. You give them affirmation. They feel more like being that uh, target gender in the, in the workforce, at school, in the community, amongst their friends. Uh, so um, so I, I often start l low and slow so that there's really minimal side effects. Uh, I, I should say there's always side effects. There's the effects you want, but there's minimal uh, adverse side effects mm. by going slow. And people will come back uh, a number of months later and say, yeah, I felt that. It's not enough. You know, I could feel um, um, physically I was different, but my voice is still the same or the hair growth is still the same. And so then we augment the, uh, the therapy. So, so there's two types of therapies. Uh, generally, a, uh, a, a trans man, transgender man, uh, will start off as a female. And so the treatment is pretty straightforward. Um, it's testosterone. And you can give testosterone in you know, four different ways. And people have different preferences, so it's very individualized. The cheapest form is uh, an injection every one to four weeks. And oftentimes, uh, people that have gender dysphoria may not be wealthy, may not have drug plans, and so they'll almost always go with the injection. Downside is that it levels go high after the injection, and then they come down before the next injection, so they're more up and down. Um, another type is topical therapy. Uh, it's an ointment that you, in a bottle, of, uh, and you make a pump on it to give them different doses, and you put that on your arms or upper chest area. And that's very well absorbed and gives you more uh, consistent testosterone levels. And the range of the gel that we can use is also variable to get the desired. Most importantly, the effect that the patient wants and secondly, um, the blood level of testosterone. And so I always uh, harp back on, you know, the blood test is less critical than how you feel today. Mm -hmm. Some people do a blood test and they get obsessed with getting the number right when really it matters more how, how people feel, how they are experiencing the changes in secondary sexual characteristics that they, they desire. Um, the third type, you can take testosterone in a pill form, um, basically three or four tablets per day. I found in my practice that about 50% of the people that take a pill, uh, it's adequate, and the other 50% doesn't work. It's not absorbed enough. And the, um, the last one, which is changes in its availability, is a testosterone patch. Uh, it used to be very similar to the gel, but lately um, they have not been supplying it in Canada. You can get it in the US. Now, the converse is um, a little more complicated when you have a transgender female starting off as a male and wanting to become a female. So there, uh, the, the, the simple observation is that, well, why don't you give them estrogen? And that's what we do. Um, we give folks oral estrogen, and that helps increase their uh, estrogen levels. But conversely, at the same time, it decreases their testosterone levels. And so that can cause changes you might expect, uh, some fullness or small growth in the breast area. Over time, changes in voice. Uh, decrease in facial hair growth, and some uh, changing in, I'll say, body sculpting or contour to be more feminine, uh, rounder hips instead of being angular, um, and, and that's the start of that process. It's rarely enough. Uh, we start with estrogen treatment, and then we put people on two other types of medications. One is called spironolactone, which is uh, um, 
an antihypertensive agent that we've used for years in people with high blood pressure, and it had a side effect, and the side effect was breast growth. So men that were cisgender, they weren't transgender, that were taking this medication didn't like the breast growth. But in the um, trans female population, they liked the breast growth. So we often give them spironolactone. And the third agent, which is probably the most potent, is uh, testosterone blockers. Um, Cirpoterone acetate is a drug that blocks testosterone. Used first in people that had uh, testosterone producing uh, cancers. Um, what we find is that if you give them the testosterone blocker, blocker testosterone levels go down uh, quite a bit. And so with that cocktail of cipriterone acetate, um, t uh, estrogen, and spironolactone, um, that's the cocktail. And over time, it has the desired effect. The earlier you use it, the more likely it is to have a, a significant effect. So sometimes I'll see people. I might not see them for six months or a year. And they'll come in. I remember what they were like the last time I saw them. And the voice will have changed. And I'll say, great. And, and they may not notice it themselves. It's only people that they've seen at infrequent intervals that notice those changes. And so when it comes to surgery, not everyone necessarily goes down the road of, of having surgery at all. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Do you know, uh, as I said earlier, everybody is, is, is individual. So surgery um, is fortunately covered by um, our Medicare plan for transgender people. And that was a big change. Uh, for many years, uh, other provinces covered uh, gender-confirming uh, surgeries. And, and we didn't, but we do now, and that's a credit to our evolution. So typically for a transgender uh, male, woman to male, uh, the biggest surgery that those folks tend to want is uh, mastectomy, breast reductions. And uh, fortunately we have uh, two surgeons in this province that do a very good job at um, contouring the chest so you look like uh, a man. It's not just... Uh, the, the surgery that people that have larger breasts that want them reduced but still look like a breast. This is to turn you from a female type chest to a male type chest. And those folks are trained, experienced, and they um, do a very good job. And fortunately, the waiting list is not terribly long. For you to have gender confirming chest surgery, you should have been on hormonal therapy for at least a year. And so our plastic surgeons uh, do do respect that, and um, and the the top surgery is usually very successful. You were talking about forty percent of trans people um, thinking about suicide. Um, do you know stats? I know sometimes in public conversation it comes up about whether people might go down the road of regret. Are there stats to to show if there are any people that go through with be it hormones or surgery that that uh, have regrets afterwards? Well, I'm going to be a bit anecdotal in this. I've had two patients, uh, two trans female patients, who started taking estrogen therapy and didn't like it, um, uh, and they regretted it and stopped taking it, and nothing was lost, nothing at all. Um, that's the nice thing about starting low and going slow, is that if people are not comfortable, they can easily come, come off and go back to where they were before. Um, in my practice, um, except for those two, I have not seen people with regrets. And uh, the literature does talk about occasionally people have regrets, but it's less common because of the uh, degree of assessment and care and teamwork that goes into it before you do things that um, you know, change your hormonal profile or subject people to surgery. Um, I heard of one case in northern New Brunswick that was back and forth a couple of times. And uh, it made me wonder, you know, how was the assessment adequate? Mm -hmm. This was not a child, this was an adult. And myself and the endocrinologist that was looking after this person said, you know, maybe if had we our time back, we would have let them uh, work more with hormonal therapy for a longer period of time. But the patient was very insistent and, you know, it's an option. So the simple answer is uh, not a lot of regret. Policy. 713 put gender affirming care in the spotlight, not just in New Brunswick, but around the world. Um, what do you think about the conversation that's being had have publicly 
Um, and what concerns do you have about the way it's being addressed uh, in the legislature, in the media, um, and how that affects uh, some of the people that you care for? Well, um, as I say, I, I care for mostly adults, so it has had less of an impact on, on an adult population. And, you know, um, I thought the original 713 was progressive. It gave support to uh, kids in our schools um, that didn't marginalize them, uh, helped them progress through a very difficult uh, quest. And, uh, and I was pleased to see it. I thought it was progressive. You know, in reality, uh, children that have gender dysphoria are not a big part of our population. Between point zero eight and point one percent uh, in general, so it's not a big number of people. The number of folks that have transgender, gender dysphoric kids in their family is not very many. And so I think it's an important issue for those children and those parents and those caregivers. Uh, I can't minimize it. Um, you know, how, how, how it can be traumatic, it can be an opportunity to help your kids, uh, help your students. So what I find is that it, um, it's become somewhat polarizing amongst people that have nothing to do with gender dysphoria, no um, real awareness of what it means, um, the assessments, the therapies that are involved. And so, uh, frankly, um, I continue to give the care that I give to transgender people, uh, pediatricians, psychologists, teachers, continue to give good, uh, thorough care, parents are involved, and I don't, I'm not quite sure why it has been such a public issue, but people are inclined to uh, weigh in and have an opinion on a, a very many matters that may not affect them directly, and that's, that's the way we all are. We all have opinions on, on things. I'm a bit disappointed that um, so much emphasis is put on uh, the revisions to policy 713, and perhaps we could be spending some time looking at ways of helping our, our homelessness uh, the uh, cost of living, uh, accommodation, um, healthcare in its broader sense, you know, those require uh, innovative thinkers and ideas and people. And f I, for one, you know, I, I, I think about transgender care, but if I'm thinking about answers that help our population, I'm a bit broader than that. So I'm a bit surprised that it's taken off, and I think it's because people project themselves into the role of parents of gender dysphoric kids and they feel empathy and they may not understand it completely but they, they get angry about it, they get worried about kids and um, you know generally as caregivers, as teachers and pediatric endocrinologists, you know, our motto is first do no harm. Help where you can, help when kids are in danger and, and work as a team through that. Well, I thank you so much for coming in today, for shedding light on gender-affirming care and hopefully enlightening people at home. Thank you so much, Dr. Dornan. Thank you for the invitation. My guest today has been endocrinologist Dr. John Dornan. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO Television.